I think the only exercise that SJWs get is stretching the truth and jumping to conclusions. In this video, I want to talk about a few SJWs who overanalyze movies to advance their feminist and socialist ideology. But Vinny, don't you analyze commercials to advance your viewpoints? When I analyze commercials, you can plainly see what I'm talking about as I talk about it. If I say a man gets hit in the balls or slapped in the face, then you will see it clear as crystal. These SJWs, on the other hand, spin the meaning of a movie way off course. First up, we have Jay Wright. He reviewed the movie Mother. I love my mother and I love having sex with her. No, not that one. The 2017 movie Mother. You know how when you criticize one person who happens to be female and feminists take that as an insult to all women? Well, Jay Wright has the same kind of herd mentality. Jay Wright? More like Jay Wrong. Everyone will have different, maybe even opposing views on what the movie is about and not about. I will say the movie spoke to me about the treatment of women and nature and leave it at that for now. Correct. People will have opposing views. Some interpretations will be wrong so they can push their feminist agenda, while others will see the movie for what it's supposed to be. He's right about the treatment of nature, but way off about the treatment of women. Sometimes it takes a sucker punch to the gut like mother to remind that, well, a lot of Americans hate women. Even American women. The problem with this interpretation is that it was only Jennifer Lawrence's character who was being mistreated. No other woman was mistreated. In fact, other women were partaking in the mistreatment of Jennifer Lawrence's character. Her character did not represent all women. She represented Mother Earth. It's not about men mistreating women. It's about humanity mistreating the planet. So not only is he way off base in what the movie was about, he's also way off base in saying that a lot of Americans hate women. People in this country bend over backwards for women. When I replied to his review, he responded with examples such as the already debunked wage gap as evidence of female mistreatment. I want to thank Aronofsky and company for making a bold movie that doesn't treat you like an idiot, spoon-feeding its message into every mouth but instead allowing us to think and interpret on our own. Aronofsky clearly meant this movie to show how humanity treats the planet. We are all living on this one planet with one mother who gave us life, and how do we treat her? You can interpret it to be something else if you want, but you'd be wrong. Now I'll admit, other interpretations might make sense if they are backed by strong evidence from the movie. Multiple theories can be fun and will allow you to rewatch a movie with a new perspective. But saying that it was about the mistreatment of the entire female gender just because only one woman was mistreated is not strong at all. Her being a woman had nothing to do with why she was being mistreated. Her character was also blonde. It would make just as much sense to say that her hair color was the reason they mistreated her. Plain and simple, the movie was a representation of biblical events. Even Jay Wright himself acknowledges that there are biblical references in the movie. Just look at the credits. Javier Bardem's character symbolizes God as evidenced by the name Him with a capital H. Jennifer Lawrence's character symbolizes Earth. Mother Earth. Ed Harris and Michelle Pfeiffer represent Adam and Eve, the first man and woman who came to the house. Younger brother and oldest son are man and woman's children, so clearly they represent Cain and Abel. And in the movie, surprise, surprise, one of those brothers kills the other. Throughout the movie, you see allegories for Noah's flood and the persecution of Christ, and so on. J. Wright is using this idea that he can interpret this film on his own as a springboard to push feminist ideas. If we could just interpret movies any way we want to, what's to stop someone from saying this film is really about baseball and ghosts in the cornfield? or this film is really a stealth sequel to the last Harry Potter movie. Nobody in their right mind would think this. Full freedom of interpretation is a license to be wrong. Speaking of which, next up we have Renegade Cut, who from this point on I will refer to as R.C. He has plenty of movie reviews where he promotes the false ideas that women are always victims, and that there is a patriarchy, and that white men and capitalism are evil. The review I'll be talking about in this video is for a movie called Audition. If you haven't seen this movie, then spoiler alert. This movie is about a widower named Shiguru looking for a new wife. So he holds a fake audition in order to find a good woman to marry. He winds up dating a woman who has a dark past. This woman is very jealous. She wants the guy to love only her and nobody else. Not even his own son. She eventually cuts off this man's foot, and R.C. still somehow manages to make the woman look like the victim in all this. One of R.C.'s main issues is the method by which Shiguru is searching for a new wife. In Audition, we follow the lonely Aoyama search for a new wife, but under questionable methods. We see he is a loving father and otherwise affable. He believes that his desire outweighs any objectification of Asami. 
He believes that what he is doing is overall good and does not recognize that his pattern of behavior falls into a worldview that does not treat women with agency, the ability to act. This has nothing to do with objectification. What Shiguru is doing is really not that different from what women do to men all the time. Men must impress the woman. Basically, men audition to be with the woman, and if she sees what she likes, then she'll consider dating him. This kind of audition that women have for men happens all day, every day. But when men do it, it's called objectification. Female sexual objectification by a male involves a woman being viewed primarily as an object of desire rather than as a complete person. No, objectification is just demonizing male sexuality. What's wrong with being an object of desire? It's a good thing to be wanted and desired. When SJWs say that women are objectified, it's really just a way to shame men for merely having an attraction to the opposite sex. Shiguru is looking for a wife. Of course he's going to want to desire her. This is, after all, the person he plans to spend the rest of his life with. He's not going to want to pick someone he finds undesirable. And they go on dates and they get to know one another, so he gets to know her as a complete person. So R.C. is way off base here. To objectify someone is to strip them of their essential character, experience, and needs. And how exactly is he doing any of that? He's just looking for a wife, bro. Aoyama probably does not consciously think of this. All he knows is that he wants a wife and does not consider the fact that deceiving a young woman into a room with him and lying to her about why she is being questioned reduces her agency. Hey, this sounds familiar. Deceiving people to go somewhere under misleading circumstances. This happened with the Tinder trap where a woman deceived a whole bunch of men on Tinder and all of them thought they were going on a date with her, but instead she had them do push-ups and races to compete for her. To those not familiar with the Tinder trap, here's what it was all about. As you may or may not know, my name is Natasha, and I have everyone here today to be on a date with me. <laughs> um, dating apps are very difficult, and I said maybe I can bring everyone here in person and see how that goes. So, do you have what it takes to win a date with me? <laughs> so. We're going to start the elimination. Half of you people here are in relationships, so those people should leave now. Anyone under 5'10", please leave as well. No beer bellies, no long beards, no bald guys, no khakis, or is any less than six inches, you know, you gotta go. You gotta go. <laughs> also, anyone named Jimmy? I don't enjoy the name Jimmy. Ready? Go! One, two, three, four, five! Swipe right, swipe left. I like his shirt. Swipe and left. Did we say 5'10 and above? <laughs> He and his friend discuss traits that a woman should have. One such trait, they say, is youth. This is not an invention of the film, though. Heterosexual male obsession with female youth is provable. Popular online dating website OkCupid mined a lot of data over the years and found something a little uncomfortable about the difference between how women see the age of men they find most attractive and willing to date versus how men see the perfect age of women they find most attractive and willing to date. This is a chart of a woman's age and the men they find most attractive. <gasps> so? The ages of women on the left roughly correspond with the age of men they find attractive, whereas men almost always respond that a 20-year-old woman or a woman in her early 20s is what they find most attractive and want to date even at age 50. Why is this a quote uncomfortable fact? Men prefer younger women. So what? It's like, how dare you men have preferences? In one scene, Yoshikawa comments on some women at the bar who he describes as awful girls, common and stuck up and stupid. This shows male anxieties and reaction over contemporary Japanese women using traditionally male spaces such as a bar. 
what makes them stuck up or full of themselves, depending on the translation. This is something men say of women who want nothing to do with them. They cannot imagine the problem might be within themselves, so if women reject men, the problem, they rationalize, must be that of the woman. Well, that might be the case sometimes, but R.C. doesn't consider the possibility that, hey, the woman might actually be stuck up. Is that possible? Or do we dare not criticize the flawless women? Asami feeds the man her own vomit, displaying an extreme version of gender role reversal in which the male is subjected to become the silent, obedient, and domesticated pet, while quite literally relies on her for means of subsistence. So rather than sympathizing with the paralyzed man who is about to have his foot cut off, R.C. speaks of it as a gender role reversal, as if to say, see, this man is just reaping what he sowed. Shoe on the other foot, so to speak. Now later on in the video, R.C. does reluctantly say that her actions ultimately weren't justified. Note the hesitation. Does that mean his torture at the hands of Asami is justified? No. Ayama and his friend also discuss what skills a woman should have. You know, like, nunchuck skills, bow hunting skills, computer hacking skills. Rather than, say, occupational skills, Ayama concludes that he wants a wife who has a performative talent, like the ability to sing and dance for him. Asami's worth to Ayama lies in what she can do for him and how she can help his life. And in real life, most women regard men the same way as human doings, not human beings. It's all about what the man can do for her. If a man is falling on hard times and is unemployed, then he is of no use to her since he cannot provide for her as much as she would like. Unemployment is not a deal breaker for men, but to a lot of women, it is. And get a load of this comment. Thank you for this. I love this movie and see it as a really important feminist horror classic. But it seems like every horror review on YouTube is about how this crazy woman gets revenge. Thanks for adding some much needed nuance. Uh, it is about a crazy woman. If the genders were reversed and it had been a man hacking off a woman's foot, I highly doubt she would say that needs more nuance. Or that his actions were understandable because he had a bad childhood growing up and went to a fake audition. Last but not least, I want to talk about Petscop. To those who aren't familiar with Petscop, it's a YouTube web series about a mysterious PlayStation game. The game starts with Tweety Bird collecting pets. Then when the player inputs a code, he accesses the strange new maker plane, where all kinds of bizarre things happen. Now what does any of this have to do with Trump's government shutdown, welfare programs, and capitalism? Not a thing. But that doesn't stop David Stockdale from Nightmare Masterclass from trying to make a connection between them. And hey, at least with me, you know what you're getting. A cranky socialist who has too much time on his hands. He tries to sound smart with his review, but falls flat. It's like the people who make up their own random interpretations of some piece of modern art, so they sound like they're cultured, but really it's just paint blotches that someone haphazardly put on the canvas. And these supposedly cultured people are just as clueless about what it's supposed to be as everyone else's. Anyway, here's what he says. In the scope of my analysis, I really consider nothing to be off the table in terms of potential threads of inquiry. Absolutely. But this freedom of interpretation shouldn't be a license to just say anything you want. If you come up with a theory, it should be backed by evidence from the series itself. Otherwise, it's just baseless nonsense. With this in mind, I recently made a certain connection that I believe is worth mentioning here. If only for the sake of perhaps better contextualizing some of the underlying thematic elements of Petscop, which up until now have been seemingly disjointed. In the very first video, directly upon entering the place known as Evencare, Paul happens upon a sign. The sign states that Evencare has closed indefinitely. It used to house over a hundred quote unquote young pets, of which a total of 48 remain. The contents of this sign evoke an economic and political term known as austerity, a set of policies which ostensibly set out to balance the government's budget through both cuts in spending, usually by defunding welfare programs that people rely on to get by, and tax hikes, oftentimes in the form of regressive taxes on working class people. Whoa. He got all of that from a sign that said there were over 100 pets and only 48 remain. From there, he's talking about tax hikes and welfare programs. Now, how does this relate to Petscop? It doesn't. In my view, 
Peskop depicts the horror that occurs underneath the surface of what, by other superficial indications, appears to be a healthy functioning system. If we were to judge the game based solely on the cheery artifice presented to us in the gift plane, we might well construe Peskop as nothing more than an unfinished children's game. Of course, there are signs along the way that subtly imply this is not the case, but it isn't until we experience the horrors in the Newmaker plane that this becomes explicit. You know, at various points in time in the last year, the stock market has been at an all-time high, and we might look at that and say, wow, we're doing great. But you know, in the broader context of things, specifically in the last few years, we in the US have been repeatedly subject to the threat of government shutdowns due to various hyper-partisan disputes in Congress, the latest of which stems from disagreement over funding for Trump's proposed border wall. So he talks about the new maker plane, but then stops and goes on to talk about the stock market and government shutdowns. What's the connection? The Petscop videos he was reviewing were videos 14, 15, and 16, and all of them were uploaded before Trump's government shutdown. So it makes no sense why he's even bringing it up. The rest of David's video is more of him pushing his socialist ideology. Even this guy has a better logical flow than David Stockdale. Whoever they are, if they're receiving messages, they might be sending them too. Wait a minute. C candy bars. Candy bars? You, you know, candy bars. They usually come in a wrapper, just like you wrap a Christmas present. Christmas happens when it's cold. Cold, as in Alaska, that's where the polar bears, polar bears, pol polarity. I can switch the polarity to see what transmissions are coming from the location this one is being sent to. 